Thank you very, all very, very much. I'd like to thank Eber for, um, of course, for organising this fantastic gathering and also for inviting, to me, speak, uh, inviting me to speak. They, they asked me to talk about uh, designing earth buildings in wet, windy, temperate climates, which is a reasonable description of where I come from. <laughs> um, it's a completely different climate to where a lot of earth building happens in the world. And I've put changing in there as, uh, in there as well because, of course, our climate is changing. And this does have implications for us. Um, I'd also like just briefly touch on what Verena just said about lightweight adobe because it's a very important topic and it's dear to us. Um, I've got anecdotal evidence, plenty of it, that gravity in, doubles in strength every 30 years. And I'm quite sure that this is having an influence on in our earth buildings as well. Certainly on the fossils when you try and pick them up. Um, anyway, let's go. Um, a little bit about where I'm coming from on this. Um, I just came across this fantastic website a couple of days ago. And it's a, it's a lovely website. You can, you can rotate this globe anywhere around the world and it's got current wind and sea currents playing in front of your very eyes. And it gives an extraordinary vision of, of how weather goes around the world and you can also see how weather patterns evolve and change. And if you want to really waste a few hours, <laughs> steer, steer at it for a while. And I, I'm also very taken with this image. And I'm very aware that one image can in fact change your attitude, and changing your attitude actually costs you nothing. But this this um, image first came to me from uh, David Eisenberg from the uh, Development Centre for Appropriate Technology in the USA. But it's an extraordinary image because if you take all the water on the planet, oops, that's not it, sorry, the point is here, that's it. That's all the fresh and salt water on the earth, that's its volume. You take all the atmosphere, that's it. And we sort of think that it's such a big world that we can't possibly change it. But when you see it like this, you can see, of course, we can change it, and of course, we have. So, climate change is changing the way we need to think. Uh, a local sculptor put this sign up in a whole installation of road signs that he had sort of. They're real road signs, but the wording, of course, has been changed a little bit in the images. But global weirding. And it's another thing that I, I found um, talking to people, and especially when the topic of, of global change or economic change and all sorts of things that go on, people sort of look baffled and say, it's weird. And I'd invite you just to think how often you hear the term weird come up in conversation, because I'm finding it happening a lot. But it does change the way we need to think. And it affects the way we need to think about our buildings. And of course, all this is based on you know, environmental stuff. And most of my clients have come to earth building and other natural building through environmental concerns. But environmentally, so we need to think very, very hard about how we build and why we build. And environmentally, the best building, of course, is the one you don't build. And Builders and architects generally and engineers aren't that fussed on that message. But if you don't actually need a building, why do you do it? And there's my wife sitting and uh, reading a book, doing the laundry, and a friend cooking dinner. You know, I, I interview clients now outside, partly because my office is a hell of a mess. <laughs> but also because most of the time, unless it's really, really adverse weather, we can sit around a table outside under a veranda and I say, you don't actually need a building at the moment. You don't need a building three quarters of the time, in fact, in our climate. You need something to keep the sun off you, you need something to keep the wind off you, you need something to keep the rain off you. It need not be a fully enclosed, triple glazed building. So that's one sort of attitude. But the other thing I like to say, we talk about buildings, but building is also a verb. It's a process. You know, we talk about buildings, but the act of building and how we build is also incredibly important. 
But before I go any further, of course, I'd like to acknowledge the role of, of Russell Andrews, who's one of the fossils we're all missing rather badly here. Uh, he was Ebar's inaugural chair, and his wife, Val's work with the Owner Builder magazine with him uh, was, was, was incredible. The magazine is still going. Linda's here somewhere. She took it over from Russell and, and Val. It's helped a lot of people build their own houses out of locally resourced material, a lot of it earth. So thank you, Russell. So how do we ensure earth walls survive in wet, windy, temperate, humid climates, especially against the background where storms are becoming more severe? There's a couple of internet pictures from Hurricane Irma. One, of course, is the weather satellite, and the other is what it did. And some of the highest winds ever recorded. New Zealand. New Zealand's had two cyclones near where I live this year. Um, that's been phenomenal. We usually have about one every 30 years. Yeah, it's destroyed the, uh, the potato crop at home. You know, it's, it's having implications all over the shop. But of course, buildings can fail from, from, from many different ways. The image on the bottom left is from the, the, the recent, fairly recent Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand, which is a 7.8 on the Richter scale, which is a very, very big earthquake. And it did some very severe damage to a whole lot of buildings. This is a, a pressed earth brick building that, that blew apart. Generally, I mean, as Verena said, earth buildings that were built according to our standards actually all survive very well. This didn't quite comply with the standards. <laughs> it didn't quite comply in quite a big way. But yeah, the, 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 the 7.8 earthquake, it ruptured something like, I think it's 21 or 24 faults ruptured at the epicentre, which was the first, first earthquake that triggered off this whole sequence of of earthquakes, the vertical acceleration was 3G. It's the largest vertical acceleration ever recorded in an earthquake anywhere in the world. The previous largest one was in Christchurch, where it was 2G. You know, 3G is your weight doubled upwards. It's, it's pretty severe stuff. Eight metre uplifts in land, and some buildings didn't do too well. But actually, like this building, it's an old historic building. It actually wasn't inhabited, fortunately, at the time, but uh, it had an enormous uh, serenity. It's a mud brick building. It blew apart, but it was uh, actually a very lovely re ruin. <laughs> you know, <laughs> architects take aesthetic, uh, um, aesthetic delight where they can sometimes. But, you know, buildings are affected by a lot of things. Um, frost can get in and freeze water in, in material and, and expand it apart. Rats. I did a, an earth, beautiful earth plaster on a wall. And I, I put a bit of straw in it and overnight, I didn't know I had rats, but rats got in and scavenged all the seeds out of the straw. Kingfisher nests. Kingfishers are a, a, bit, a little bit like a small version of a kookaburra, not nearly so rowdy. But they decided that this um, earth wall here was a perfect place for them to build their burrows. And when they actually had uh, chicks in there, they were very, very aggressive. Bottom left, I mean, it's a slump out. It's a wattle and door building. Uh, material was probably left a little bit unprotected. It got hit by some severe rain. It's not... Uh, let's go. I mean, we're familiar with that sort of slumping from time to time. The one on the bottom right is an odd one, and perhaps it's a Kiwi one, but it's sheep damage. They were hungry. Yeah, the sheep went in, there were some minerals or salts in the, in the, in the bricks that they wanted to, to lick out, so over the course of a, a hundred years or so, they, they, they went for it. It looks a little bit like splash up from, from the ground, but it's not. So in, in the course of my, my many years, I mean, I, I've been involved with... Um, I started with rammed earth, but I, then I went mud brick, and I've looked at pressed earth bricks, and I've looked at wattle and daub, and I've looked at uh, light earth bricks, and I've looked at straw bale, and I've looked at the whole lot, and designed for all those materials as well. Um, but in the course of having uh, 
develop that experience, they also get asked to, to go and look at buildings which are having a bit of trouble. And, you know, nearly every time I see failure, it's a result of exposure to excessive, excessive moisture, and nearly always it's wind-driven rain. Now, we've had some... The trouble with coming at the end of the day is half of what you want to say has already been said. But, you know, we've had some talk about destruction before and what the mechanisms of it. In many places where I live, the rain is like being exposed to a water blaster or a fire hose. I mean, it comes horizontal, it can come solid, and it can come for three days at a time. It really, really does hammer in. And we still try and build earth buildings in this place. I mean, it's a bit dumb, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the image is of a very old rammed earth uh, building. It lost its roof. A lot of the historic earth buildings in New Zealand lost their roofs in the Second World War uh, because the steel was needed to go and uh, blow up other people with, apparently. But as we've already, as we've already talked about today, some buildings, they, they form a kind of protective rind and we've seen it, and we know about that, and we've talked about it today. And some earth materials you know, get minor surface loss. Some exhibit much deeper damage or failure after contact with <coughs> excessive moisture, and some materials are completely unaffected. So it makes, you know, we know adding cement doesn't fix things, you know, it's not that simple. It can even make things worse. And there are many examples around the failure of, of I'm sorry, I'm not as polite as the Germans. Crappy concrete. And I'm not really saying that soil cement is itself is a crappy material. More my... I think, like, like Jomo, I, I, the use of a very high-intensive energy material to stabilise earth is not the best use of that material. And I think we have to think in a different way. But I'll probably touch back on that. But yeah, we've, we've had complete building failures uh, with cement stabilised material that's got wet. It's mostly wind driven rain has driven the water inside the material. The clay has expanded and just blown the things apart. Window sills, we've already talked about that today as well. Often affected, the window sill on the top left is actually a mud brick. Only someone thought that accelerator runoff of a window would be resisted by mud bricks, and it wasn't. Um, the one at the bottom left, of course, is rather spectacular, and you end up with very annoyed people and very rich lawyers. Now, this this was a this was a very interesting one I saw last year, I think it was. It's a round earth building. It's got some reasonable weather protection, it looks like, but it is on top of a hill, and it does get wind-driven rain coming at it horizontally. The rain actually went down through the tiles and the windowsill, and partly, and partly got just driven into the walls. But if you look at this area here, the, the material has actually expanded, and the clay and the, the unstabilised clay has expanded. But look, look at the bow in this window on the top right. Can you see that bow? That glass in that window was compressed. I mean, why it didn't shatter, I don't know. But it was absolutely and incredible, incredible compression. But of course, again, a very unhappy hunter. And we've already talked about this too. We know some earth materials resist moisture very well, so much better than others. Some don't even react. I mean, this is becoming old news today. But interesting enough, I, f I found an, an old mud brick that a guy in his 90s had built this little earth brick shed. And he did it to prove that he could build out of this material, and then he wanted his family to let him build a house out of the same material. And he said, don't be stupid. But he had the bricks lying around. And this, this particular brick had actually been lying out in the weather, for something like 40 years. You could still see the guy's fingerprints in the surface of them. And I did the spray test on, on this particular brick, and it did nothing, nothing at all. And it's just clay, it's just a clay material. 
We did try making bricks from it. It was actually incredibly hard to get the, the material liquidated, uh, liquefied enough to actually make bricks out of. But there's some extraordinary materials around. But, you know, how do we go? I mean, we've, one thing I found years ago, and I, it was never in any books when I found this out and read it, but the answer for stabilising a lot of clays was aggregates. And I found that the addition of aggregates, especially somewhere in the 2 to, 20, two to 10 millimetre diameter, made an enormous difference. The clay at my own property will make a perfectly good mud brick. One shower rain and it'll, it'll dissolve. I put 50% of the size aggregate on it and I can leave it out in the rain virtually forever. So the, the addition of aggregates is, is incredibly important, or having aggregates in your mix is incredibly important for durability. So, but even if durable, wind-driven rain can make earthworlds leak. Another unhappy punter. See, so rain's come round the joinery, it's come through control joints, it's come through from where the shuttering bolts were, were impacted, were you know, packed, and the water's just driven through. It comes through the wall foundation joint, not easily, but that's, that's, it does come through there. And uh, here, that was a building which I wouldn't have thought was that exposed, but the wind came up over the hill bringing rain with it and just hammered it. Um, water can soak right through the wall and completely destroy the material. Um, even if moisture comes through, it can bring through some salts and the, the efflorescence can slowly lead to destruction of material and surface loss. It's not a structural issue, but it sure is an aesthetic one and it's a uh, contractual one. So the, answer, the, the question I've been asked about 10 million times, I think, is how, what surface coating can I put on to stop water causing damage to my, uh, my earth walls? I'd love five bucks for every time I've had the question given to me. So I've looked at hundreds of walls that have had all sorts of best magic goose put on, and nearly every time I've found failure. And that's already been explained to us a little bit today as well. But by making that, that surface a little more impenetrable to water, inevitably you get the moisture getting in behind that brick somehow. Sooner or later, moisture will get in there. It tries to come out. It hits this um, improved surface and takes the surface off. It may be an aesthetic thing, but it can lead to further destruction. It can keep going. So, yeah, I've seen plenty of examples of failed surface coatings. The building on the, the one on the bottom left is looking pretty nasty. You know, as an architect, I don't actually want my clients to um, ring me up and say the wall's not looking too flash. <laughs> this one cost a, a great deal of money to sort out. And this is um, a lime plaster on an old historic building. Again, it's, it's seen better days, but... Um, you know, so I, I mean, I guess the point of all of this is I don't believe surface coatings are really the answer to having significant improvement in building design when it comes to severe wind-driven rain. We get failed paints, we get failed, pl failed plasters. I mean, if you think this is all a bit academic, this is a building I actually went up to visit this year. It's a 20-year-old pressed earth brick building and it performed absolutely fine for 20 years until a very major storm came through. It was one that was described as big, you know, one in a hundred year storm. It was one of those most huge events that was completely out of, out of, broke all the records. Three days after the storm, this, the, 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 the poor people who owned this house noticed that the surface was starting to come off the walls and the, and, and the gable. And a couple of days later they realised that this is part of the house, that the gable end is actually a, a 150 thick, um, oops, sorry, clumsy fingers. Where are we? 150 thick 
um, pressed earth brick veneer, sitting on top of a 300 thick solid earth um, pressed brick wall. And what this storm actually did, they, they said it was being struck like, you know, the poor people, they, they couldn't go out in it. It was like having a water blaster fired in their face for, for hours and hours and hours. And the mechanism of failure was this. The water got driven through this louver. Up till then, it had just shed water, as everyone expected it would. Behind, that louver actually didn't um, ventilate the attic. It actually had building wrap behind it. The whole wall behind the veneer had building wrap behind it. Water got driven through the louver, got into the back of all the veneer, sat on top of the solid earth wall below, had no place to go except soak through the bricks. The clay content in the brick was such that all the bricks started to expand, pop the, uh, pop the whole surface off the, um, off the gable end, and an engineer came round and thought, bloody hell, <laughs> or something like that, and arranged for these props to be put in place, because they thought the whole wall was collapsing. The whole wall wasn't collapsing, but the veneer certainly was. And so, yeah. Anyway, we managed to sort that out. But it's already been mentioned again today, you know, building science, the old rule of thumb, good boots, good hat. I mean, it's still very, very, very good advice. For, it's good advice for any exposed earth wall, I think, but uh, in a particularly windy, wet climate, it's particularly good. What I like about this design, we only found this about a year ago, didn't know about it, um, when we were looking at earthquake damaged buildings. This was in the earthquake zone from the Kaikoura earthquake. Very minor damage down to this old cob building. But the intermediate roof at the gable end is an absolutely beautiful, elegant solution of getting weather protection to the lower part of the wall. The gables are the most exposed, but it's the bottom of the walls, the bit that gets the exposure, the eave up the top diminishes in effectiveness the higher up the wall you go. But now, now, now we're getting all posh about this sort of stuff, so we talk about um, deflection, the four Ds, deflection, durability, drainage and drying. So how do we deal with that? How am I going for time, Steve? Okay. Okay, good. So deflection. Keep the worst of wind-driven rain off to minimise and limit its impact. This is actually a light earth brick house I designed a few years back. A reasonably sheltered site actually, but big eaves, really big eaves around it. It hasn't been plastered yet, obviously. And deflection is very site specific. So. Not all of New Zealand is exposed to um, wind-driven rain. There's a small portion of it which actually gets virtually none. So this 19th century old um, gold miner's cottage is absolutely fine with virtually no eaves. Um, a friend of mine lives in it, and he lives by himself, and if anyone's interested and wants to live in an earth brick house, he's got a sign above his double bed that says, Vacancy. <laughs> I think members of half the population can apply. <laughs> and this little cob cottage, which I designed years ago, um, also it's in a very, very stormy, windy spot, big eaves. I mean, that's pretty simplistic stuff. Sometimes we don't want to put eaves on a building, or sometimes they're not adequate. So we're looking at ideas of rain screening. That is, putting something outside the, the surface of the wall which we can, will break the impact of that wind-driven rain. It's not a full cladding, but it's enough to break down the impact of that water and that wind. So the water that hits that wall will run down the inside of our cladding and come off. The one on the bottom left, the picture on the left there, it's a, a, a timber screen that's been spaced off the wall behind it. And the lump of slice of rock is actually a house for a geologist, so you have this slice of rock, which is actually another bit of rain screen, and is, is put a shower against that, outside shower. The one on the bottom right is a little bit more interesting, I guess. So they put a, um, a sheet material up and glued tiles to it and made a very decorative 
you're in a part of the, it's a retrospective job, that one, where one corner of a house was too exposed, so they, they, they stopped the rain hitting it and solved the problem with water coming in and damaging the earth walls. Window jams, we will rebate them, or even better, we face mount them. I mean, face mounting is a really easy thing where the weathering is taken to the very outside of the wall, which is where you want the water to stay. Trying to rebate joinery is really difficult. Or, no, it's not really difficult, it's just harder. But interesting enough, we found this 19th century building where this is the outside surface of the wall, it's lime plaster over mud brick. The windows are set way, way back into the wall, almost on the inner edge. But by building some, some of the window joinery out to the face and putting some cover boards on, they've, they've got the rebate there in a perfectly sound, very well deflected bit of rain going on. In the earth building standards, we have pictures like this, which show the rebate and how to do it and dimensions on it, you can't go further than a third through the brick and you've got to have cover boards and blah blahs. Um, there is a New Zealand doc, apart from the New Zealand standards, there is also a New Zealand document called E2AS2, uh, which is an acceptable solution which um, built on the earth building standards. They reckon the drawings we had in the earth building standards didn't look like good weatherproofing details. So they asked us to redo them, so we redid the same details and put a few more words on them. And um, you can get that online if you want to check that out. But, you know, a lot of architects tell me we don't like the look of face, face mounted joinery. It's, you know, we like the stuff to be rebated, but face mounted joinery can look absolutely fine. Five minutes. Five minutes. Speed up north. Okay, durability, so that's what we've really been talking about. Moisture that gets past the deflection needs to be resisted by the material itself, and there's been quite a lot of talk about that already today. And we know some materials are more durable than others, and the spray test has been mentioned as being a bit dodgy, that's also my experience, but we do use it. And what we use that, and other durability tests, cyclic wet and dry tests, a drip test or the spray test, is establish a durability index. And with earthen materials, durability and resistance to external moisture are totally intertwined. And I found that the eaves that will make a building resist external moisture causing trouble are always more than you require for durability. So we just um, go for the eaves that require to stop buildings leaking, basically. <coughs> and this is, a, this is a chart that we're developing for the new earth, the revised earth building standards where we've got wind zones, we've got erodibility index, and we've got the amount of eave you need uh, to protect that wall. So it's prescribed. So low wind zone, which I think is the ultimate design speed, 32 metres per second. Um, you need a 600 millimetre eave on it. 2.4 high wall, effectively. And you get down to a very high wind zone, which is 50 metre per second wind speed. Um, you need a full veranda, one to one. It sounds a lot, but we found it works. And we're doing this in a graphical form as well. Very high wind speed it equates to 180 kilometres per hour. Uh, we have another wind zone, 55 metres per second, or nearly 200 kilometres per hour. We've taken, we're not trying to design for that. We said, get, get an expert knows what they're doing to help you with that one. Drainage. Once the, wind, once the rain, the wind-driven rain gets past your deflection and the impact of it's broken and materials are resisting the, the wind and rain that hits them, we still need to get that water to drain away. What water gets past that and what we're doing now is window sills that shed the water well clear, jam, um, jam flashings that direct the water to the sill trays that direct water outside, and also waterproofing under the sills because we found that to be a weakness. Drying, the other part of it is drying. Once the moisture 
was drained away. As much of it as you can get rid of, doesn't hit your walls, you let it drain away. Um, then you must let what moisture is still there dry out. So high, high humidity, which is another part of our temperate climate thing, it, it slows drying. So we do get problems with uh, greening on walls, which can grow moss, which can uh, hold moisture, which can then cause efflorescence and cause other damage. Um, I did one sculpture in New Auckland's Gart Gully with a, with a um, sculptor, and her whole idea was to get this building, it was light earth bricks with a lot of fibre in it, <coughs> try to grow mushrooms in it. Her idea was we wanted this whole building to collapse as part of the thing, as a sort of allegory for the economy. Unfortunately, the, the stuff wouldn't, she couldn't get mushrooms to grow and it wouldn't collapse. And then it became a toxic, um, the site was declared toxic. <laughs> so there guys in their, their high hazard seats removing the earth building. <laughs> it's great. Future of standards. Uh, we'll, uh, just, we, Verena's already said we're revising them. What might be of interest, in fact, is because I can, and because I've been given a sort of a wink and a nod from the government to do it, we're going to increase, we're going increasing our range of materials hugely. So our earth building standard is going to go round earth, mud brick, cob, precious bricks. Uh, we've got 2,100 kilograms per cube at the moment. We'll probably up that a little bit because I think the upper limit's a bit low. Low density earth, which Green has been telling you about. Light earth, which is just a straw clay mix. We're going to put a bug in a bit about that. Straw bale we're going to put in. Earth and mine plasters and earth floors. So in one document will have the whole range of natural building materials that have some relationship to clay. I claim straw bow because we stick earth renders on them. Future natural building, well, we've already talked a little bit about that, but what I, there, there's some light earth bricks. Um, a good test if you want to know what your density is, are you under 1,000 kilograms per cube, of course, is to float them. Um, but the whole future natural building, I, I don't talk about earth building, I talk about natural building because I think earth building is only a tiny part of a much bigger scene. But it does rely on collaboration, cooperation, and I think things like this conference is a very good example of that. We need to be open to using a whole range of, of appropriate and biomaterials. In the society of building with carbon, we do have to decarbonise our economy, and that's why using high intensive materials like, like cement and steel, we have to minimise as much as we can. Not because they aren't fantastic materials, they are, we can't imagine life without them. But if we can find ways of using materials that don't use those high energy intensive materials, we're helping the planet. And that means all of us. Bruce King's coming up with this idea of, of actually building with carbon. And it's another way of saying you suck the carbon dioxide out of the air by some biological process, usually growing timber or fibres, and we effectively, by building with those materials, you're, you're sequestering, you're pulling that carbon dioxide out of the air, you're sequestering um, the carbon, and it's a very, very potent and new way of looking at building. And of course, it's the whole idea of, of education, spreading the, uh, the skill levels. And it's very interesting to hear the, the talk before of what's stopping the spread of natural building, earth building, and cultural, I think, actually nails it on the head. People aren't used to it. It's not part of what most people do in our, in our societies. And, and that's something we've got to come. But, yeah, we've got so many directions to choose from. And, um, yeah, thank you all very, very much. <laughs>